Well, good afternoon. It's now 13.25, so I guess we'll start the session. This is the session on annotation and visualization tools, and it will be moderated by my good colleague Stelios Piperidis in Greece and myself, Konrad Smet, working from home in Norway. We have five papers in this session, and the session will be structured slightly in a slightly different way compared to the uh, previous one. First, we will have uh, lightning talks where each uh, presenter of a paper presents the main goal of the research just to refresh our memory because we're supposed to have uh, read the abstracts or the extended abstracts of the talks. And then we'll take questions one by one. The first question being, does your paper address well-identified annotation or visualization requirements of a community of researchers? And if so, how have these requirements been elicited? Second question will be, what new research questions can be addressed or facilitated by the resources and or tools developed and presented in your paper? And the final question, how easy has it been to reuse and adapt existing resources and tools for the purposes of your work. What are the main challenges you have faced uh, or are facing in terms of adaptation? So, and then finally, the, uh, there will be uh, hopefully some time for follow-up questions by the audience, but remember that this afternoon, later this afternoon, there will be a Zoom session where you can uh, interact. So before we go uh, to the main questions uh, for each paper, uh, we will uh, give the floor to uh, each presenter for a lightning talk about what the main point of the paper was. And the first paper is Sticker 2, a neural syntax annotator for Dutch and German, who will present. I will present. Damian. Hi. Uh, yeah, thanks. So uh, Sticker 2 is a neural um, syntax annotator that uses um, transformer networks. I think one of the key points is that it does uh, multitask annotation. So it means that you can train a single model, uh, annotate multiple um, annotation um, layers. It also does structured prediction. So it can predict dependency relations and uh, lemmas. And uh, the starting point of any sticker model is uh, a pre-trained language model, um, such as BERT or XLM Roberta, because that gives uh, by far uh, the best performance. Uh, so one of our points of focus has been to make this really work for production. So first of all, we wanted it to be fast. Um, so we can annotate in the order of 200 censuses per second uh, with state-of-the-art accuracies. Uh, it's also easy to deploy because it's a standalone binary that only requires one other library. And we support uh, model distillation to distill large models into smaller models. That's it. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, the second paper is exploring and visualizing WordNet data with Germanet Rover. Who will present? I will. Can you hear me all right? Yep. Richard? Uh, yep. Yes. Uh, so Rover is a web application for exploring Germanet. Uh, Germanet is a WordNet for German. Uh, if you don't know what that means, basically it's a, it's a large data set that aims to capture how concepts are expressed in German. Uh, and how they're related to one another. And the basic idea is that words uh, which express the same concept are grouped into sets of synonyms called synsets, uh, and those have further relations to one another. So basically, Rover allows you to search for synsets uh, and shows you all the data that's associated with them. It also allows you how to calculate, uh, it, is also, it allows you to calculate how closely different synsets are related to each other. Uh, so for example, you can see on the right in the graphic, um, this synset for guitar has four different kinds of relations to 17 other synsets. Uh, and the, the relation that's actually pictured in the, the sort of network diagram there is the, uh, what's called the hypernym relation. That's called, that's basically the main relation in Germanet. Uh, and you can see that the guitar synset is pretty closely related to the synset for violin. They're not too far away from each other in the graph. Okay, thank you very much, Richard. Uh, the Third paper is named entity recognition for distance reading in LTEC. So I will present Francesca Frontini. Hi, but, Francesca. Uh, hi, but uh, my co-author uh, Carmen Brando is also in the audience. Uh, so this work uh, is part of the activities of the cost action distant reading and aims at developing methods uh, and tools to linguistically and semantically annotate the multilingual European literary text collection which uh, is uh, currently being created and is already available on the Cost Actions website. 
we manually annotated a subset of this uh, LTEC uh, collection with named entities and compared manual annotation with the results of named entity recognition tools for four languages. We found that the results are varying and there is definite room for improvement. Uh, the added value of this work uh, lays also in the publication of the manually annotated collection with the guidelines, as well as in a series of uh, import export annotation and visualization uh, tools. The presentation of this work at the Clarin Conference is motivated by various avenues of collaboration that we envisage from dissemination of the data set to the domain of the adaptation of the uh, NER tools in uh, various languages for this domain. Okay, thanks very much, Francesca. Then we go to paper number four, which is by Jan Ondek, Towards Semi-Automatic Analysis of Spontaneous Language for Dutch, the SASTA system. Uh, hello. Uh, what we did is we uh, developed an initial version of an application that partially automates the analysis of spontaneous language. And the uh, analysis is done in accordance with uh, certain methods that are in use in the community of people who try to determine language uh, development of children and language development disorders and the status of uh, patients with aphasia. The focus of this application is on grammatical analysis. And we have uh, achieved some results, which are not in the extended abstract, but uh, in this poster session, uh, I can present all the results. And in the demo, I will give a, uh, in the bazaar, I will give a demo of this system. What's the relation to Claren? Well, first of all, this application is based on a Claren application, an application that was developed in the Claren context uh, uh, called Gretel, the, the version four. Uh, I believe it can have, if successful, a uh, societal impact because uh, we can automate or partially automate a, a particular procedure that is considered very important uh, to do a proper analysis of language disorders, but it is usually not done or uh, because it's not paid and it's a very labor intensive work. On the other end, it may also contribute to Clarin because we may derive a derivative program which allows you to improve uh, chat uh, annotated data. A second aspect in these uh, kind of resources is that deviant language is abundant, and we did a small experiment on that, uh, that I can report on uh, in the poster. And the next steps that we have a successor project to concentrate even more on deviant language to act to test the application uh, and its usage in actual clinical environments. And also we are working on a project to integrate it with other apps developed by other partners. Thank you very much. Yo. Uh, that seems very useful. Uh, the final paper uh, will report on something with the acronym ICE Neural Parsing Pipeline, which is a neural parsing pipeline for Icelandic using the Berkeley Neural Par uh, Parser. And the presentation will be done by Thorin. Yes. Okay. Hi. Thank you. Hi. Um, so we describe a new resource within Icelandic language technology, which is this parsing pipeline for Icelandic text called ICE Neural Parsing Pipeline. And the pipeline includes an Icelandic model of the Berkeley Neural Parser, which is a state-of-the-art neural parser, which has shown good results. Uh, the parsing model is trained on the Icelandic parsed historical corpus, which is a one million word manually corrected diachronic corpus. And the model delivers an 84.74 F1 score and can parse up to 228 sentences per second by using a GPU. And the pipeline includes all steps necessary for parsing, parsing Icelandic text. Um, it includes a pre-processing step, which tokenizes and spits sentences, a parsing step, which POS tags and parses, and finally, a post-processing step, in which some text cleanup is done and the parsed sentences are formatted so that they are more legible. And the pipeline is, of course, um, published at Clarin under an MIT license. Thank you, Thorin. Uh, now we will start the discussion, which we will take question per question. And for each question, the five uh, presenters get, can give an answer in maximum two minutes. And Stelios will manage the discussion. OK, Stelios? OK. Yeah. yeah, yeah, absolutely. OK, over to you then. 
So thank you very much, Conrad. Uh, thank you all for uh, your uh, presentations. Uh, really nice to see five uh, 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 applications uh, that are related to Clarin, uh, and they cover a really wide range of, um, uh, uh, let's say, of, uh, of needs. Uh, now, what we would like to discuss here is uh, the extent to which uh, each paper addresses well-identified annotation or visualization, let's say, requirements. It is mostly annotation requirements here uh, of a particular community of researchers. And if this is the case, uh, how have you elicited uh, uh, requirements from prospective users? Uh, as Conrad said, the idea is that we take uh, um, uh, one paper after the other. So I would like to ask uh, Daniel uh, to uh, uh, brief us on the position of uh, Sticker with respect to this question. Yeah, thanks. So um, I think our audience uh, with regards to this tool is mostly uh, linguists and computational um, linguists. And um, yeah, I think um, the points that I will raise are um, things that you hear often when you go to workshops or conferences, um, that these are things that people want or bother them. And uh, the first one is, I think, actually quite sounds mundane, but people just simply want the best possible accuracy. Uh, it's kind of obvious, but um, in recent years, the progress in neural networks and now uh, pre-training based on language models has pushed up the scores by three, four percent more accuracy, for example, for dependency parsing. Mm -hmm. And yeah, that's something that we should really return to the larger community so that they can annotate with uh, higher accuracies. I think another important thing that um, sometimes comes up is that um, if you have pipeline approaches to natural language processing, um, you, you often encounter the well-known error propagation problem. But another thing that often happens is, say, if you first use a part of speech tagger and then a morphological analyzer, followed by a dependency parser, that it happens often that the different annotators don't actually agree um, on the annotation. So for example, the morphological analyzer will say that an uh, MP is an accusative case, and then the dependency parser will say, oh, this is a subject, right? And um, this is quite problematic if you, for example, want to formulate queries, et cetera. So, and uh, I think, um, yeah, this approach solves this problem because we use multi-task annotation, which means that in the end, all the classifiers for the different layers uh, use the same hidden representation. So they use the same information to come to the final decisions, which uh, more like say an HPSG or an LFG or CCG parser, um, results in more consistent annotations than these pipeline approaches. Sounds great. Yeah. Daniel, uh, 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 sticker two is available through Weblicht, right? Right, yes. Okay, so it is available to the whole Clarion community, right? Right, so there, there are two possibilities. You can use it through Weblicht uh, as an advanced chain. Mm -hmm. uh, there are also pre-built Docker images that you can download to run it as a server or as a command line. Uh, yeah. Okay, thank you very much, Daniel. Uh, we go on uh, with uh, the second paper, ex and I think it is Richard's uh, turn, exploring and visualizing WordNet data with German Rover. Your position, Richard, with, uh, with respect to this question? Yeah, so um, Rover is it's a, basically a new interface. Um, it combines and refines some of the functions of some earlier tools we had. We had um, older desktop tools for searching and browsing Germanet, uh, and also a different tool for studying semantic relatedness. Uh, so we, we already had a, a kind of community of users who we knew were looking for a tool like this. And we heard, we heard from those users what they were looking to do, uh, especially when they read to us with, with questions and in feed, incorporated that feedback into Rover. Uh, so for example, one of the features Rover has, uh, which our earlier tools didn't have, is the ability to search with regular expressions. Uh, that was the direct result of some user feedback. Um, we've also added quite a few other options for, uh, for searching by grammatical category and so on, um, uh, and improved our semantic relatedness calculations. Uh, another thing, you know, one of our goals with Rover was to just make this tool uh, more available to a wider audience. We have lots of different kinds of people who, who need um, some insight into what's going on in Germanet. You know, everyone from students to researchers 
uh, working other, in other fields. So part of what we've done is make this a web application. So it doesn't need, it doesn't require any special software or you know, downloading the data set. Uh, and yeah, it, it's the idea is to make it um, easy to use for people who uh, are interested in Germanet for whatever reason. Mm -hmm. And the initial requirements, I understand, came mostly from uh, uh, scholars uh, and researchers in the area of linguistics, computational linguistics. Uh, yeah, that's right. It is like this. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much, Richard. We go on with uh, Francesca. Uh, name entity recognition for decent reading in LTEC. Francesca. Yes. Um, so, um, oops, uh, let me start the video too. Uh, within, within the context of the cost action, um, there was a specific uh, working group, working uh, WG3, dedicated to literary theory and history, uh, animated mostly by literary scholars, and they came up with a, a set of research questions and requirements, and they are still actually developing them, which uh, are then to become desiderata for the NLP annotation in uh, working group two of which our work is part. Uh, and uh, uh, so these requirements, of course, uh, they, uh, they mirror the needs of literary scholars. And in particular, they emanate from research questions about uh, the evolution of the European novel. And uh, we will come back to this uh, in, uh, when answering uh, the next question. So uh, we take, we, took up these requirements and uh, we um, follow, we, we use them to create our annotation guidelines for NER uh, and uh, also to uh, guide us in assessing the results uh, of the, um, so both in creating the manually annotated corpus and in assessing the results of the uh, automated tools. And uh, um, we will then uh, see what are the uh, results and how uh, we can improve on that. Thank you very much, Francesca. And we move on to Jan, analysis of spontaneous language for Dutch. Yes, thank you. Well, the application uh, that is described in the paper is targeted at clinical linguists. Sorry. I... Um, yeah. And um, it has been developed in close collaboration with the delegation of these uh, clinical linguists, a delegation of the Association for Clinical Linguistics in the Netherlands. The annotations that are made by the tool are defined actually by independently defined methods uh, that are well properly documented in, in books, uh, et cetera. And the uh, application uses an input format, an annotation format, and output forms that are in use in this community. However, we had to insist on formalizing certain aspects of the input documents because they contained ambiguities, and we reached agreement with the community on, on that. So that's the answer to the first question. It's great. Thank you very much, Jan. And uh, we finished this first round of questions with uh, uh, the Icelandic paper. Uh, yes. Thuron. Yeah. Uh, so an accurate automatic parser for Icelandic text has not been available until now. And including mm -hmm. the parser in the, this pipeline is um, very crucial because it makes it more accessible to a wider range of researchers. Um, because but which need... researchers are you targeting in particular? Uh, mostly linguistic research, researchers, sorry. Um, because ICEPAC has been used a lot by, for example, for syntactic research. And training the parser on ICEPAC um, makes it even more accessible because people are used to the annex annotation scheme. Um, and yeah, so it, the, and also the speed of the parser. Um, makes it possible to make a large corpus of uh, parsed text. So these linguistic researchers can use uh, this pipeline for this, um, for this reason. And also, so we, as part of this uh, project, we created two large corpora, uh, a tree bank, which includes 1.7 million words and another tree bank, which includes 524 million words. And both of these um, tree banks hadn't been, or they include text that hadn't been parsed, which can be used by these um, 
linguistic researchers mostly. Mm -hmm. And yeah, but of course it can also be used for uh, parsing one sentence at a time. Uh, for example, to, to decipher a sentence's meaning if you're working in language technology or something like that. But the, yeah, the main, main focus group is the linguistic researchers. Okay, thank yeah. you very much, Sorun. So we have, we have at least uh, three already identified uh, uh, communities, one that is very close and very dear to us, to which we belong, linguistics and computational linguistics. Uh, but we also have literary studies and scholars from literary studies, uh, as well as uh, uh, researchers from uh, um, uh, clinical trials uh, with respect to um, uh, language disorders, speech disorders, etc., in a particular language. So moving on to question two, uh, the what would be interesting to discuss is out of these applications what new research questions uh, you believe can be addressed or be facilitated by the the resources and or the tools that have been developed and presented in uh, in the paper and we follow the same order we start with uh, with daniel um, yeah so i i think um for for our part it's not possible to answer new research questions as much as um, better being able to answer your research questions for two reasons. One um, that I already mentioned, um, the improved accuracy. Uh, but I also think it opens up the possibility for most research researchers to annotate much larger corpora. So uh, on a single laptop, yeah. sorry? And in much shorter time. Yeah, exactly. So uh, on a single uh, laptop CPU, um, so CPU, not GPU, you can annotate 200 sentences per second. So to give an example, um, we have this large tree bank in, in Tübingen called the Tuba DDP, which consists of 1.2 billion tokens. And we can annotate that whole tree bank uh, during a workday. So it's extremely fast. And uh, if you look at Weblicht integration, for example, it means that people can annotate novels or even say a, a year of newspaper text uh, without waiting long, right? So you can um, really annotate really large amounts of data, which will hopefully uh, improve um, research. Mm -hmm. um, I think the other thing uh, that I mentioned before already, uh, which will also be much better is uh, one thing that we found when we do linguistic studies is that, uh, like I mentioned, the pipelines, there's disagreement uh, often between annotations. And often when you uh, formulate a query, say in Tiger Search uh, query language or whatever query language uh, you use, um, often you use uh, queries that percolate through all the layers, right? So you combine, say, a part of speech with a topological field with uh, a dependency relation. And I think that kind of research can be carried out much better when the layers are more consistent because you don't have to uh, uh, cover all these edge case, cases which go wrong with the pipeline approaches. Okay. Thank you very much, Daniel. Um, and then Richard. Uh, <clears throat> so <clears throat> Rover is, is yeah. Yeah, Rover is quite open-ended. Um, it basically shows you all the data we have in Germanet and it, it shows you kind of the local structure of Germanet. So it's potentially useful for any research question that could be answered um, by looking at that local structure. Um, one thing we talk about in the paper uh, is the example of studying uh, morphological productivity. So this is basically the question of how easily a word forms uh, compound words in German. So the, the example we give uh, is the pair of adjectives reich and arm, uh, basically rich and poor. Um, and those adjectives often appear in, in compound adjectives. So uh, erfolgreich uh, means success rich or successful, uh, for example. And the question is how often, you know, how often can you form new adjectives using these, these two basic ones? Um, by using the regular expression search feature, which I mentioned earlier, you can, you can find out that reich forms adjective compounds about three times more often than R, which, which I yeah, think is kind of an interesting fact. Well, it's interesting, but you could also find the same thing through uh, corpus search. Uh, that's right. So the, one of the, um, again, the main advantage here is that this is a uh, quite accessible tool. All you need is, is a browser 
Um, and yeah, if you just have a sort of one-off question, it's, it's easy to answer it rather okay. than, mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, thank you very much, Richard. Uh, we go to Francesca now. Yes, uh, so um, as I was uh, saying uh, before, there, uh, there was a set of uh, uh, research uh, questions which were developed within the framework of the cost action. Uh, just uh, to, to specify, uh, the whole objective is to publish eventually the whole of the multilingual health corpus with several layers of annotation, syntactic annotation, also uh, speech acts uh, and uh, named entity. So for what concerns named entity annotation specifically, uh, some of the research questions uh, that came out were um, related to the idea, the hypothesis that the 19th century novel in Europe is strongly identified with the private space, the bourgeois home, and to assess this hypothesis. So we had to include in the uh, annotation uh, indicator of social structure and roles such as honorifics, uh, names of professions, etc. Another set of research topics uh, touched upon uh, uh, the questions of identity, otherness, uh, and also the distinction between urban and rural places. So this requires annotating demonyms, uh, higher granularity of uh, annotations of toponyms to distinguish between uh, villages and, and cities, etc. And finally, uh, you, they, we were urged to also be able to recognize, automatically detect mentions of works of art, authors, folklore, and periodical publication to be able to capture also cultural references. So that's my, my answer. Thank you very much, Francesca. Um, uh, we go on with Jan. Yes, thank you. Um, the application that we have developed is primarily targeted at non-researchers, uh, clinical linguists who actually use it in their clinical practice. So it is, uh, if successful, it could be an illustration of a clarin derived application with social impact in that it makes analysis of spontaneous language more efficient and perhaps can even increase its quality. However, many of the techniques employed can also be used in a derivative program that we're working on, which we have called ChampNL, which enables improvements of the Dutch childish chat uh, files. And this is uh, useful in any case, but it is as, uh, especially required if more sophisticated analysis of uh, chat files based on morphosyntactic properties in the more tier uh, and or syntactic structures in the gra tier are made. And we actually already offer a service to enrich Dutch chat files with Chitmore and Gratius, but we notice that the results of these um, analysis uh, deteriorate if the uh, chat files are not correctly annotated. And we offer now also a tool to help uh, make better annotations. Thank you very much, Jan. Thank you. And uh, we complete the second round with uh, Thorun. Uh, yes. So as I mentioned before, uh, various linguistic research has been done on IcePack, which is useful when you need uh, accurate manually corrected data, uh, but the data doesn't necessarily has to have to be extensive. And this, par this parsing pipeline makes it possible to do similar research on very large amounts of parsed Icelandic data uh, on texts which have not been manually parsed before, as we see uh, in the two tree banks I mentioned before. Um, and the parsing pipeline is accurate enough to suffice for some research, although it is not uh, manually parsed or corrected. So it opens up the possibility of running queries on large new tree banks, which are automatically parsed. And that suffices in some cases, although it of course doesn't replace manual parsing when you need very accurate data. Um, and for example, word order in IcePack has been researched but now we can ask how the same phenomenon behaves in parliamentary speeches, because they are included in one of the new tree banks I mentioned, uh, which is called Ice Country. Mm -hmm. So that is the main, um, the main well, that's research. That's very nice. But uh, I have a question about, you know, your, I mean, your system apparently is um, an analyzer for about nine centuries of Icelandic. Mm -hmm. uh, so why did you um, choose to, uh, make one pipeline for everything is if i understand correctly i mean does it perform equally well on all the centuries i mean there, so, there were some changes in icelandic although mm -hmm. i must say uh, maybe not as many as for some other languages yes yes of course yeah sorry um, sorry, Arun, sorry. Yeah. 
th there is a related question from uh, from Erhard in the chat. Uh, Erhard says, I have a question about the parser for Icelandic, if I understood correctly. The parser is trained on a historical corpus. Have you experienced any difficulties when parsing language data for contemporary Icelandic? Uh, let me let me keep the question of Conrad and Erhard mm -hmm. for the third question. Uh, can we go to the third question, Conrad? Yes. Okay, so the third question and, is... And by the way, we can also follow up during the session this later this afternoon. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. So the question is, how easy has it been to reuse and adapt existing resources and tools for the purpose of your work? And what are the main challenges you have faced or are facing in terms of, uh, of adaptation? Since we started with uh, this question by Conrad and uh, the question by, by Erhard, let's uh, reverse the order. And we start with Thorun, this last... Uh, uh, question. Yes. Mm -hmm. So um, I use for this um, for this project. I used four existing resources: uh, the parser, the Berkeley Neural Parser, um, a BERT model, uh, IcePack, as we talked about, and and then a previous parsing pipeline for Icelandic, uh, which I built this parsing pipeline on. And training the Berkeley Neural Parser took some time. Um, but it was successful, and I did some experiments actually with IcePack, where I um, used um, so I in the in the most accurate model, the data is distributed throughout the centuries. But I also made some experiments where I took the um, youngest data, used that as training, and also the oldest data to see how it performed and what changed. And I saw that the using the youngest data was better than the oldest data, which makes sense. Um, but the distributed model um, still was more accurate. Mm -hmm. And I think if we had uh, more data from each century in IcePack, if it would be a bit larger, maybe, um, I could try with um, training on maybe part of IcePack and testing on that part as well, you know, so um, it would be data from more similar centuries. Um, but yeah, so um, yeah, but okay. I could use IcePack with this uh, accuracy. And then I, of course, as I mentioned, I used the BERT multilingual model when I was training. Um, because a BERT model solely trained on Icelandic data was not um, available. Uh, but it, that would probably make it a bit more accurate, I think. Thank you very much, sir. And in the benefit of time, because I see the clock is ticking, uh, we move to Jan. Jan, you've used Alpino. You report on uh, on a number of issues. Uh, yes. The application is based on components from the Gradle 4 application, in particular the upload functionality and file management facilities, the cleaning of chat annotations and input files, the parsing by Alpino, and the querying functionality. And these components had to be rearranged to make SASTA suited for applying multiple queries to a small text corpus instead of a single query to a large or even huge corpus as is done in Gretel. This uh, aspect was not difficult. It was work, it had to be, uh, of course. A completely new aspect was dealing properly with deviant language or with language that the parser are actually not able to cope with and is therefore deviant from the parser's perspective. And properly here means identifying the deviancy and treating it in such a way that a sensible pass results plus an explicit marking of this deviancy. Mm -hmm. And dealing with this properly is very important, not only because it plays an important role in assessment of language development and language development disorders, but also deteriorates the grammatical analysis of the text. And this is a new challenge that we are now working on in this successor project. And I'm happy to tell about more about that in the poster session. Thank you very much. And now we move from the challenge that uh, the challenges that uh, deviant language uh, use uh, poses to other challenges, uh, Francisca. Yes. Um, so uh, the purpose of the cost action was to begin with to test uh, uh, the tools as they were. Uh, uh, although for some some languages, especially Portuguese, we also had uh, adapted uh, tools, which uh, we saw worked better. So there is need for domain adaptation. Uh, another uh, need was also to have tools that were adapted on, not only in terms of models, but also in terms of usability, because the idea is to have uh, to, for literary scholars to be able to use them. Uh, so ideally you would want to have uh, 
a web interface, etc. Uh, this wasn't always always true, of course. So one uh, one, one one idea also to uh, for collaborate avenue for collaboration with Claren was would be also to help us create models that are more adapted and also more usable, for instance, by incorporating them in tools such as the Claren switchboard. Mm -hmm. And we would be able, happy to discuss this uh, in the post style session. Thank you very much, Francesca. Richard, any challenges with respect to adaptation? Richard? Richard, can you hear us? Uh, Richard, unmute your microphone and turn your video on if you're there. I think Richard is no longer here. Oh. Uh, there is a, uh, okay, okay. I can, I can take over if, if you want. Sure. Yes, Richard, please, yes. <laughs> so um, uh, the adaptation uh, issues uh, were not that severe because as uh, Richard mentioned before, we had previous tools. Uh, so, and they basically uh, could be uh, incorporated uh, more or less uh, wholesale. So this was really more uh, adding functionality and uh, you know, switching from a uh, desktop application to a uh, web app application. So uh, the um, <clears throat> challenges were primarily of a technical nature of uh, making that migration happen. Um, uh, we also uh, discovered, and this of course is always sobering to figure out, uh, that there were some bugs, you know, in uh, the uh, relatedness algorithms and uh, it was a good time to uh, fix those bugs. Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Um, Erhard, I have a follow-up question. Uh, so uh, there there were some other, um, some other, uh, um, visualization tools for um, word nets, like for example, for Dumnet, the Danish one, there was one that was available online. Uh, did you ever consider uh, building further on one of those visualization tools? Uh, we looked at them and uh, I think uh, we kind of follow the Mao principle that uh, many flowers bloom uh, here when it comes to visualization of word nets, uh, because uh, I think uh, they were kind of developed with different kinds of goals in mind. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, the uh, the goal of Rover really is uh, um, to try to um, highlight uh, semantic similarity. Yeah, and uh, this I, I posted in the chat. I think it's a very useful tool. For example, if you're looking at productivity of uh, morphological processes like compounding, because it's not a random. Uh, uh, generalization that happens when productivity increases. It always has some prototypical model that it's modeled after. And so it's very important to have this notion of semantic similarity. And uh, there is also a kind of interesting application here uh, that maybe I should uh, throw in. Of course, semantic similarity is all over the place, right? So if you have neural models, uh, you always uh, try to compare vectors uh, to, uh, you know, approximate uh, semantic similarity. I think it's a very, uh, very good exercise to have more traditional uh, uh, technologies like word nets as a kind of corrective, also in the spirit of our invited talk this morning, right, that you should really uh, use different methodologies and see how they sort of stack up for different questions. Thank you very much, Erhard. Uh, sorry, I have to rush uh, because we have just two minutes uh, till the end of the session. So, Daniel, uh, your turn. Uh, yeah, thanks. So, um, I, I think for us, there are two ingredients. One is gold standard, three banks. Mm -hmm. And the second one, which is, I think, the pain point, are pre-trained language models. And um, as has already been mentioned, for some languages, there are monolingual models like uh, Berger for Dutch or Camembert for French. Um, but there's a lot of active research in these transformer-based language models, and nearly all of them just produce English models. Mm -hmm. So uh, they're of no use to, to us. And uh, these new models are especially interesting to us um, in more production use cases uh, because they're um, 
uh, oriented at being more efficient, so being smaller or faster. So for us, uh, and the problem is that these training, pre-training these models is really expensive. That can cost thousands to ten thousands of euros. Mm -hmm. So for us, it would really help, I think, if a larger organization like Clarin uh, would curate a multilingual corpus and would take transformer models as they come out and pre-train um, these models on that curated corpus. I think that would be really helpful to a lot of uh, cutting edge uh, NLP research. Interesting. Mm. Really true. Thank you very much, Daniel. Uh, we are already at 14.05 uh, Central European time, which means that uh, this session has to end and we have to pass uh, over to uh, the third session. Thank you very much, everyone.